The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. He's got a really interesting history, I think, that's relevant to a lot of things we're talking about. Um, you're going to hear a little bit about disruptive innovation. You're going to hear about someone that spent a lot of time on renewable energy, trying to get new technology to the marketplace, um, and about kind of the, the trials and tribulations. So I, I would encourage you to kind of really ask lots of questions and, uh, and enjoy yourself. Bob, thank you very much. Great. And you can ask those questions right from the beginning, so I would encourage you to just raise your hand any, anywhere along the way. Um, so when I was your age, I sort of wondered about why there were little kids in the world that didn't have clean water to drink. And, uh, and that sort of bothered me. And it was that kind of thing, really, that got me interested in engineering and got me interested in clean energy. And uh, it's hard to imagine, like, 30 years have gone by since that happened. I mean, you guys aren't even 30 years old. That seems like forever. Um, so I'll tell you about MTPV. This is a clean energy technology uh, that our startup company is developing to bring to market. And, uh, and I'll also tell you some about my own personal uh, journey uh, in, in clean energy. And uh, happy to take it where, wherever you want to go. So uh, maybe, maybe I'll do a couple of slides on sort of the technology and then, then do then you know where I am at the moment and, uh, and then how we got here and, and, uh, and then we can go from there. So our technology is called MTPV. It stands for Micron Gap Thermophotovoltaics, blah, blah, blah. It draws on nanotechnology, MEMS, and photonics. And uh, what really motivates us is that we think that it has the potential to change how we think about energy because it's a way of, of applying these very powerful uh, techniques, you know, the whole, the whole chip that we see in our iPhones and we see uh, changing so many aspects of our socio-technical life, if you will, uh, bringing these kinds of capabilities to bear on the energy world, which in some ways is, as you've been learning in this course, is uh, in some ways it's changed a lot and in some ways it hasn't changed very much uh, in, in the last hundred years. We still make heat from things that we get from the ground and then uh, we do things with that heat, consume it as heat or turn it into electricity, et cetera. Uh, our technology turns heat uh, into electricity. Um, and so we start with a photovoltaic cell. You're all familiar with them. You see them on buildings these days. It wasn't that many years ago when folks really didn't even know what photovoltaic panels were because you didn't see them around. Uh, it's quite remarkable. In fact, um, when I was just about getting ready to finish undergraduate work was just about the time that President Reagan took the solar panels off the White House. Uh, now, now they, they, weren't, they weren't solar electric panels, they were, just, they were just hot water panels. But clean energy wasn't, uh, it wasn't the, the primary focus of, uh, of, of too many folks at that point in time. MIT actually, in that time frame, had a solar house even. Um, sort of modern architecture, lots of glass solar house that uh, that later came down uh, about 15 years later, but now lots of things are moving in that domain. So we start with a photovoltaic cell. You're familiar with the sun, putting photons on the semiconductor material and making electricity. There's another field uh, called thermophotovoltaics, or TPV, uh, where we have an intermediate body which receives the heat. The heat can come from any uh, conventional sources or solar, uh, and this, this body, at right now, what we're doing is around 1,000 degrees Celsius. Things start to glow red around 600 degrees Celsius, so this is very hot. Uh, it radiates photons. It glows red. Uh, and, uh, and those photons are then converted to electricity by photovoltaic cell. So uh, how many of you have heard of Planck's law? OK. Um, so Planck's law was sort of the foundation of quantum mechanics and modern science in the 20th century. And, uh, and Planck's law tells you how many photons come off a heated surface um, and, uh, and what wavelength uh, they are. And uh, so 
the photon flux, the number of photons coming off, off that surface, um, is per square centimeter is given by Planck's law, and we represent that here, 1x, Planck's law. And uh, there were reasons that we thought that if you brought that real close, you could do near-field coupling and you could exceed Planck's law, and it was somewhat controversial in the beginning. In fact, uh, uh, in a meeting with Herman House, who was a real powerhouse uh, in electrical engineering and photonics, uh, unfortunately passed away a few years ago, um, the first time we came in his office with this, he said, forget it. He said, there's just there's no way to violate Planck's law. And uh, about an hour later, he realized that we weren't really violating it, that we were operating outside of the uh, limits of applicability that Planck himself had put on the law. Um, Planck's law says that uh, the, the geometry of all the pieces of the system have to be large compared to the wavelength. And one of the geomet geometric pieces of the system is the space between these two surfaces. So literally the gap between the hot surface and the photovoltaic surface. Uh, in MTPV, or micron gap thermal photovoltaics, we put them very close together, like 100 nanometers apart, and, uh, uh, or a, a tenth uh, of a micron. And, uh, and when you do that, you get near-field coupling, and the photon flux, and therefore the power out, can dramatically go up by about an order of magnitude. And so he said, oh, OK. He said, so you actually want to put the photovoltaic cell into the near-field or evanescent field of this heated surface. And he said, yes, exactly. He said, OK, well, maybe you can do better than Planck's law. And, uh, and so really, this, this is the field that, that we've been pioneering. Uh, using this uh, mechanism, which basically uh, derives from the fact that inside the hot body, there are photons generated in every direction. Um, it's only the photons generated inside that come up to that surface, normal to the surface, or nearly normal to the surface, that actually get out. So in a hot body, most of the photonic energy that's being generated all the time is trapped inside. Uh, but if you bring a surface uh, up close enough to it, as those photons approach the surface, they, they, a photon is, as Professor House pointed out, actually has extent, it has size of something on the order of the wavelength. So we don't usually think of photons as having a size, uh, but they, they have an approximate size, something like the wavelength. The wavelength we're working with uh, is two microns. Uh, the gap here is only 0.1 microns, so this big two micron photon comes traveling up towards that surface and just goes right across this vacuum gap between the two surfaces, enters a photovoltaic cell, and then can become power. So it's all the photons that are uh, impinging upon the surface off normal uh, that get into the photovoltaic cell here in our technology, MTPV, that do not get out of that hot body, the trap side of the hot body there. And that's what causes this uh, increase in power. So why do we bother doing that? We, we think that uh, there are a number of uh, places of application. Um, I think in the course, you guys have contemplated or are about to contemplate a number of different sources of energy uh, as well as uh, uses of energy. Um, so one of the application domains is vehicles. Um, and we'll come back to this slide at the end to discuss them in a little more detail. Uh, there's solar energy, portable power, industrial, uh, which is the first one um, that we're working on right now. The other one not shown is building power, a cogen for a building like this. So the first one is uh, waste heat. Uh, there is lots of waste heat uh, in lots of places. Uh, the the uh, focus right now uh, for our technology is industrial waste heat, the kinds of things that you see in these pictures, specifically uh, a, a glass plant. These are the basic uh, modules. Uh, these are the chips uh, of which you saw a schematic a moment ago. So there's a, the, this is actually a chip stack. Uh, each, each one of these is a pair of chips, the hot chip, uh, and then below it, uh, the cold uh, photovoltaic chip. So we build them into arrays, uh, and then we take these modules, and we build those into uh, arrays uh, like this, where we have a housing on the outside, and then the chips go on a, a mounting uh, and control uh, substructure, if you will, which uh, is mounted inside of this hollow housing. So the hollow housing protects uh, from the outside uh, combustion gases, et cetera, allows the heat to go through the surface into the chips, makes electricity. That's it. It's a very modular technology. Um, 
and uh, and that's one of the one of the promises of it that it can be uh, deployed we, we call it kind of non-invasive um, and uh, you've talked about disruptive technology uh, some in the class uh, which has become an important understanding uh, in the business of bringing all technology and not even just technology but products to market and uh, the idea of disruptive technology is the new technology comes along and it's not very good technically compared to sort of the incumbents that, that, that are on the market but it finds a niche where it can perform uh, often the niche is called non-competition right? So uh, developing a product, you look for a place where there is no competition. And this is an example of a place where there is no competition. Uh, this uh, sits outside a coal mine. Uh, coal mines nowadays, they go down in the ground, and then, the, coal and then the, the, the front, you know, the digging front, if you will, the interface between the air and the mine and the coal that's still in the ground, comes down and then proceeds horizontally. And uh, one of the issues with coal mines is... Uh, uh, is there anybody that has not heard of a, uh, let's see, how do we want to ask it? Has anyone heard of a coal mine explosion? Raise your hand. Okay, so most folks have heard of coal mine explosion. So why do coal mines explode? Any guesses? <coughs> Please? Trapped methane. Yeah, trapped methane, exactly. Um, uh, whenever you're digging up coal, you also liberate trapped methane, natural gas, very explosive. And so they go through lots of uh, um, uh, ways of controlling the methane content in the air so that the coal mine doesn't blow up. But they do blow up sometimes. And so what people have started to do is drill down in front of the coal mine, this, this vertical face that's coming horizontally under the ground. They drill down into it like this, and they liberate the methane in front of that. And, uh, and then what do they do with the methane? Well, this is what they do with the methane, believe it or not, oftentimes. I mean, if it's big enough, it's, if it's stable enough, then they will actually uh, you know, feed it into a combined cycle uh, or, or some type of uh, combustion system to make electricity. But first of all, the coal mine front is moving, and steam turbines don't like to be moved. Um, and so they, that's why you see this very portable-looking infrastructure here that ac they actually move it as the coal mine is moving. Um, and what they need to do is they just need to destroy the methane. So, so here is methane being destroyed in that uh, inner pipe there. And, uh, and the idea is to just take panels like this and to run them down the middle of that tube and to turn that into electricity. And, uh, you know, so no one's really doing this right now because of some of the reasons cited. You know, you could do it with, with steam. So maybe we should ask a question. So um, you guys, are some of you familiar with steam turbines or, okay, all right. So uh, you could imagine putting condensers in here, gathering steam and running steam turbines and making electricity. Um, and, uh, but it, the idea is if you had a module, sort of like a, a photovoltaic module, but made out of high temperature materials that you could put in it, easily move, uh, that would be uh, preferable. And, and the, the reason that this is sitting here in this picture the way it is is because the steam turbines are not feasible now. And so what we're going, this, this is an example of non-competition in the energy space, and clean energy space in particular, because uh, you know, it would be a way of making electricity with zero net emissions relative to the status quo. I mean, this is the status quo, so those emissions are going out anyways. If some of the heat can make electricity, that electricity is zero net emissions. So, so this is uh, an, an example of non-competition we go after that. We could not compete against uh, GE's gas turbines right now. Our, the performance of our units are not good enough to do that, but they are good enough uh, to do this uh, in, in the near term. And uh, just as uh, the original integrated circuit chips, when they first came out, they didn't immediately displace uh, uh, tubes. But they got better and they got better. And I think Hiram talked about the disruptive example of the Sony uh, radio. You know. There were still tubes and radios for some amount of time after those chips were in those tiny little radios. And uh, so you could kind of view our chips as an analog to those chips and those transistors, and this is an application uh, to, to the transistor radio. You know, there the transistor radio had to be able to move into kids' bedroom, et cetera. Here it has to be able to move with the front of a, uh, of a coal mine. Another application uh, similar is uh, combusting 
uh, 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 volatile organics as they're loaded on and off of ships. So in the back here is a harbor. This is down in Houston. Uh, in the very back, you can actually see a little tiny flare, which uh, basically a flame sticking out a pipe, which is the older way of doing these things and which people have tried to eliminate because uh, flaring, of, you know, flaring of natural gas uh, reduces the greenhouse impact by about a factor of 20. So if you have natural gas and you just vent it to the atmosphere uh, and you compare that with burning the natural gas before you vent it, you reduce the global warming impact by a factor of 20 by, by burning it. So in a way, flares are a big advance on just venting natural gas, but flares have their own pollution uh, issues. And so what has become prevalent, particularly in, in uh, the most developed countries at least, are enclosed flares. So this is a, a stack, basically, uh, and, and it encloses a flare uh, like this flame. So as the ships are, off, are, are loaded here, uh, the volatile gases that fill the tanks before the liquid goes in gets pushed out, and it has to go somewhere so it doesn't explode. And where does it go? It goes to this right here. It gets burned, uh, and that heat is just liberated. And so uh, we are working with a vendor that would put our panels right across this tube, right in this flame. Uh, to convert that heat uh, into electricity. Uh, so it's, it's another example of, uh, of, of non-consumption. I mean, these things are running all the time, and, uh, and, and that heat is not uh, being used because there's no good way to do it right now. And uh, this is just another example, the same module that you saw. Bigger panels. This is the kind of panel that might go into uh, uh, a glass factory, which is depicted here. So uh, natural gas comes in here, it burns, it melts sand and lime and things, which get pushed into this big furnace with bulldozers. Literally, it's quite amazing. And they melt it, and it becomes uh, like volcano lava sort of in here. It's actually glass. And then out the other end, it flows down and becomes plate glass, like for the windows up there, et cetera. And so uh, th this is the exhaust duct. The exhaust comes up here, and right now, uh, uh, these, these furnace, the type, a type of furnace called oxy-fuel furnaces, uh, where oxygen is taken out of the air and put into the furnace, uh, they create the heat. The heat uh, just goes up the stacks. Our panels would go in there and convert that to electricity. That's actually the first, uh, uh, the first application um, that, we have, uh, that we are working on developing. Um, so I'm thinking about pausing at some point and, and uh, and uh, I guess one question is, how many of you are not electrical engineers? OK. OK, how many of you are not chemical engineers? OK, and how many of you are not mechanical engineers? OK, how many of you are bio folks? Uh, OK, all right. Um, OK. Um, and I know we have some DUSP and some poli sci folks and, and ocean engineer folks, et cetera. So, um, okay. Uh, so this right here is an actual picture of the same kind of furnace that you saw, actually the exhaust port of it. And this is the same kind of housing that you saw. And this is some initial testing uh, that we were doing, uh, moving the panels uh, in and out of this facility. This is an earlier version before we came to this uh, what we call product platform, which is the basic architecture that we've been talking about uh, to date. Um. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, uh, I'd, I'd I'd be happy to do that. Yeah. Um, I, I initially uh, kind of got interested in this kind of market here, and uh, how, how many of you think you might someday? Uh, start a company or be part of starting a company. Wow. That's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's, that's more than, well more than half the class. Okay. So what are some of the ideas you're thinking about? Just to get a few examples on the table. Samuel? Uh, I think solar thermal fuels could be cool. Solar think. thermal fuels. Yeah. So building like liquid or gaseous fuels out of solar thermal energy or? Yeah, like finding some molecule which can like act like a photo converter and okay. like the sun's energy and store it as chemical bond. Okay, okay, sort of like artificial photosynthesis? Or? Yeah. Okay, all right, cool. Uh, somebody else? Yeah. 
a lot of hands went up for starting companies, uh, uh, including energy companies. Oh, come on. Yes, Maxwell. Biotechnology. Biotechnology, okay. Um, can you say uh, in, in, in the energy context or different than that? In, in the energy? No, probably not. Probably not, okay. Uh, what, what, what realm? Medicine or? Uh, yeah, probably something to do with medicine. Do that. Okay, okay. Um, okay, some, someone else, either energy or, or not energy. Let's see, who else had their hands up? <laughs> Engineers are so, so engaging. I love them. I spend my whole life with them. <laughs> so what else? Even if you're not interested in it yourself, something you know that somebody else might start. Christopher, yes. Yeah, a system for converting uh, hydrogen into ammonia for fertilizer. Oh, interesting. Right now, I'm originally from Iowa. The uh -huh. two things we have a lot of is water and wind, and uh, wind energy electrolysis to produce hydrogen yep. and using that to produce ammonia. Uh -huh. so you also have a lot of farms in the area. Mm -hmm. So then that, that fertilizer would go into the food food production then? Yeah, because yeah. Uh, wind energy, a lot of the times where the windmills are is far away from where the electricity is consumed and you lose a lot to resistance. And so it would be economically more efficient to produce ammonia out of it. That's a, that is a really cool solution to uh, to having the ship, you know, build big grids and ship the power all around. So there's wind in Iowa, and there are farms in Iowa. Wow, that's neat. Uh, so, somebody else. All right, let's see. Uh, so, who has not? Who is thinking? Who is not thinking about starting a business? <laughs> all right. So, do you mind if I just call on a couple of you to? Say what you're thinking about, Latifa. I, mean, I have no idea. <laughs> you're right. But you think you might start a business? I mean, maybe if the right idea comes along. I mean, like, uh huh. The right idea to okay. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Scott. I think for myself, and I'm guessing for a lot of people in the room, uh huh. Uh, I want to start a business at some point, but I don't have any good ideas yet, which is why I have it. Uh -huh. I haven't pursued that yet, so uh -huh. um, I think that like a lot of people at MIT have this entrepreneurial spirit, mm -hmm. but just uh, don't have a good plan. Yet. Uh huh. Okay, that's important. Uh, yes. First name? John. John. Yeah. Uh, well, for me, I think even if I were to have a good idea, I don't think I would even uh, venture to try and start a company at this point in my life. Mm -hmm. I think that there is valuable insights I could gain by working in the industry for a while, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's engineering or not. And as you become more experienced, you actually understand how things work in reality. Then at that point, your the idea that you thought that was good maybe wasn't. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it turns out to be, then you'll you'll have more experience to actually make it happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Make, makes a lot of it's sense. About the idea, it's about the <coughs> Absolutely right. It's the idea and everything else it takes to turn that into a product, doing something useful for people in the real world. Okay. Uh, one, one, one more uh, input, just to have a little collection of inputs. One more. Anyone want to jump in? Columbus? You thinking about what will you do? What, what year are you in? I'm a senior. Senior. Okay, okay, good. Um, so just based on the very little you know about our technology, you know, uh, make an argument for uh, starting which one you would start in. Because one of the most difficult things in launching a business, whether you're doing it as a startup or whether you're doing it in an existing large company, is what market to go after first. Right? And uh, you know, there are advantages and disadvantages to different markets. Um, one of the advantages of doing something in large companies, you may be able to go after more than one market at the same time, but oftentimes not. So, uh, so it's sort of like uh, selecting a spouse, right? 
Um, you know, how, how do you, uh, you know, there are, there are lots of different interesting candidates in the world, right? And how do you narrow it down to, uh, you know, a, one particular person? It can be a painful process. And uh, so this can be a painful process too. So somebody say something about why you would or wouldn't choose one of these four as an initial uh, uh, launch market. Yes, Samuel. Uh, I would say pick the one with the lowest barrier to entry. <coughs> lowest barrier to entry. So what do you mean by barrier to entry? Um, like, you can think about like what sort of things are going to stand in the way from getting your product okay. into actual use. Mm -hmm. I mean, like things where there's a lot of like infrastructure to go through, or you can like really established industries, they can be mm -hmm. kind of hesitant to take on new technologies, mm -hmm. whereas things that are kind of less established oftentimes will be more open to just with changes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So how might you address that challenge? Oh, did you have right here? Yeah, please, go ahead. Okay, the, these are really these are really good inputs, Charlotte. Um, I was thinking I would go with industrial just because a lot of I mean for solar power in like industrial areas, um, a lot of times industrial plants are located like outside of cities, so they wouldn't need as much like interference. And I think that I mean obviously like industrial plants produce like use a lot of energy and for probably into like on-site cogeneration, so that's the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. So we have. Uh, Low barriers to entry, portable power, industrial sector. Right, interesting. John Mario? Yeah, uh, so I, I think um, I mean, all of those four are pretty capital intensive as far as uh, starting a company goes. Mm -hmm. So I think, um, I think scalability will be a big factor. So that's why mm -hmm. I think also industrial is very interesting because mm -hmm. if you look into a lot of, uh, I guess, clean energy initiatives, tend to be uh, you know, very focused on like the I don't know, in the utility sector, how you can make things more efficient, uh, mm -hmm. or industry in terms of manufacturing. Uh, I think personally, uh, there's too much emphasis focused entirely on just, or for startups, just in technology per se. Mm -hmm. But I don't personally see that many, for example, consulting firms advising how startups can secure I know, government grants and how startups mm -hmm. can position themselves to take advantage of all the existing policies related to energy or something like that. I think. There's a, there, there are a lot of different areas that you can use knowledge about, mm -hmm. you know, energy and so on, uh, but without necessarily producing anything, uh, mostly mm -hmm. advising for this as well. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more than just the technology. Right. Okay. Um, these are all really important points. Uh, and as engineers, that, that may be one of the hardest ones to get. Um, and it sounds like you guys probably already have a very good sense of that, uh, the ecosystem that there's more than just the technology. But oftentimes the technology is hard, you know, so it takes lots of your focus. So, um, uh, and, 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 but then you've got to make all these other decisions. So in, in our case, uh, we really struggled with portable power um, because uh, it's small, you know. And so uh, compared to the industrial, uh, industrial, you need like more chips, which requires more capital, more manufacturing capacity. You've got to deal with bigger vendors, and there's more bureaucracy and everything else. And so the portable power was very, uh, was very attractive to us. We ended up going with industrial, okay? And so any guesses as to why we might have done that? Yes? Um, from what I've seen, your technology is most along with them. You know, they have very energy intensive um, processes that are also um, you know, capital intensive in a 4% or 5% uh, mm -hmm. efficiency gain, mm -hmm. something that's valuable to them in the long term. And it's, right. they also have a long life cycle. It's not like mm -hmm. a laptop that has a two year life cycle, maybe you're not going to get a return. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's not a thousand degrees. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and you have a, a much 
four diverse ecosystems. Here sure you have maybe 20 major players. They all have mm -hmm. um, you know, enormous plants that operate at high temperatures. Mm -hmm. They can make the decision to save 5% yep. with your, your capital. Yep, so that, that, that was definitely part of it. Um, performance. How good a performance? You know, we, we, you start with the, the technology is just new. How good does the performance of the technology have to get before you can do, you know, X market? And, uh, and, and here, we felt that it was, was more stringent because here, you know, say we're going to go into a, a laptop. We had to compete with, uh, with lithium-ion batteries that are in, in laptops. And so, uh, th you know, this kind of goes to technical details, really. Um, but that, that was a factor that we felt that there's no way you guys could know a priori sitting here. But, but we felt that it would have been harder to get that level of performance as opposed to the industrial uh, situation where it just, it, but basically it's, it's economic. It needs to be economically feasible, but it doesn't have to be any better than that. Uh, and there's really uh, no competition. Um, another thing was, uh, some of you guys mentioned related things, and that is how tightly do you have to integrate with other companies, with other techni uh, technologies, with other applications? Um, and, uh, and we felt that uh, in the industrial, uh, for example, the heat source. What kind of heat source are we going to use? Where are we going to actually get the heat? Here, uh, the heat would have to be produced in a very small combustion device, a pretty high-tech combustion device. Um, and so we would need to very tightly couple with another, another company uh, to do that, uh, as well as the, the heat rejection, uh, safety, FAA regulations, et cetera. Um, whereas in the industrial space, the heat was already there. So it was just uh, another piece of complexity that, uh, that, we, didn't, uh, that we didn't have to deal with. Um, okay, so uh, let's see. Let me, that, that, that's about all I have uh, with slides. Yeah, well, What's your life story? Yeah, My life? life story. How, the, how did you get from undergraduate kind of interested in this stuff to yeah. selling to glassmakers? Yeah. So my life story, so you really want everybody to be able to take a nap right now. <laughs> Doesn't have to cover all aspects of your life. No, I know. <laughs> um, yeah, so I mentioned in the beginning what kind of triggered it, right? Uh, and uh, I guess there were two things. Then there was an energy shock in, like the, in the 70s when I was a kid, and then I was in late 70s in college. And it looked like energy was really important. So I guess you guys are sort of, the fact that you're in this class, the fact that this class exists, and the fact that you guys are in this class, you know, means that energy's gotten a lot more uh, visibility uh, now than it, it did, say, uh, in the 80s. Um, so at any rate, uh, I started, uh, what got me actually started was an article in the Boston Globe in 1978, in the summer. I was sitting down the Cape at my girlfriend, later wife-to-be's uh, cottage, reading the Boston Sunday Globe on a Sunday, and there was an article that said, kid in Texas gets 100 miles per gallon from 68 Ford Galaxy. 68 Ford Galaxy was a big uh, car that probably got like, you know, I don't know, eight miles per gallon on a good day, right? 100 miles per gallon. So could that be true? So uh, who thinks that it could be true? Who thinks that it could not be true? And who's not sure? <laughs> right. Okay. Um, I'm not sure. Okay. No, I mean, it all depends on how you define the vehicle, et cetera, et cetera. You know, there are only so many BTUs in a gallon of gas. But at any rate, um, so it led me to the patent. I was, I was uh, thinking about medical school. I used to, I studied at a school down the street, the other end of Mass Ave. So I used to drive by this place. I have three graduate degrees in this place now, but the way I really discovered it was driving down Mass Ave. You know, what, I mean, obviously I knew about MIT, but I really didn't, I really didn't understand what engineering was. You know, I thought if like you liked math and science and stuff like that, well, you could be a doctor, you know? So I figured, well, maybe that's what I'll do. So I was a government major because I was interested in the kinds of things that you're talking about in this, in this course. But I really like math and physics, all, uh, science and, and, uh, and math. And so I figured, well, I'll, I'll do medicine. And, 
And then I read this article, you know, and so then they, they kind of came together, just like you guys are doing in this class. You know, you have technical backgrounds of, of various sorts, and you're here learning about the whole, the whole picture of energy, which, which really is, I mean, in some ways, unfortunately, much bigger than just the, the technology, um, because it makes it much more complicated. But in a way, that's what makes it uh, that much more important. Um, and uh, so did early experiments. Uh, in this realm, found out about solar energy and photovoltaics, um, came over here, and Steve Centuria taught the class on microfabrication. The interest in photovoltaics brought me there. I ended up spending a semester here while I was an undergraduate down the street, which if any of you are not seniors, I highly recommend just get yourself down Mass Ave. Take just one course at that other institution. It's totally free. It's totally easy. Uh, it's a it's a very it's a very different world, and you'll be glad that you did it. You can uh, you can write me for your money back uh, if you if you don't if you don't think so afterwards. Uh, at any rate, so I started my first company while I was a senior in college, specifically to develop energy technology, and it took probably 15 years to really do it directly, which is this right here. Uh, although along the way, so from you know, in the family garage, tinkering with engines and trying to figure out, can somebody really get 100 miles per gallon? Um, and, uh, and, uh, and patient family kind of dealing with all that. Uh, and then uh, uh, right then in the beginning of the 80s, difficult recession, you know, where do you get a job? Do you really want to do clean energy? There are no clean energy jobs. And uh, I went to work in the aircraft industry because I'd also taken Fred McGarry's course here in composite materials because I was interested in composite materials for what? Why might you be interested in composite materials if you're interested in energy? Wait a minute, we've got we to we get somebody else, John Mario. Thank you. Come on, Kristen. That's lightweight Yeah, exactly. Exactly, right. Exactly. Yeah, and, uh, and so uh, they wanted to build lightweight helicopters. And so uh, uh, later on, I realized that, you know, Light, I didn't, it wasn't so clear at the time that I was really working on clean energy. You know, lightweight, strong materials, which are, are now going lots of airplanes and vehicles. Um, and uh, I, I thought I was in the aircraft industry, but I was really working, pursuing my interest in, in, in clean energy. Um, and then uh, another uh, stint with a company up the street, MITRE Corporation, another spin out out of MIT, uh, well, Lincoln Lab spun out of my team, and MITRE spun out of Lincoln Lab. Uh, and when we started to explore some of these, uh, some of these concepts, um, and, uh, but I really wanted to try to do things more directly, and uh, linked with sort of energy is the food piece um, that uh, Christopher mentioned. And sort of, uh, you know, if a, the notion that if a home, uh, if a home as part of like like what's a what's an energy system in a home? I know it's real easy, but what's 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 an energy system in a home? That every home in the United States has. Yeah, Jacob. HVAC, exactly. So make making heat heat people warm in the cold weather. And then what's what's another energy system in the home? Oven. Okay. What might the oven run off of? Or electricity. Okay, so then electricity is another energy system. So you know, one thought is so you know, what if the what if the what if there was a food system in a home also? Going back to uh, Christopher's point, and so just the notion of uh, of the home as being sort of the energy energy central of your physical well-being, whether it's in the developed world or, or in developing countries, even more important perhaps in developing countries. At any rate, so. I, it made me want to build a house, and I built a house while I was working full time, and then built another one. And so then I, I did that for about eight years. And we were leaders in energy efficient housing, no surprise. And, um, and over the course of time, we built some miles of roads and 150 uh, homes. Um, and, then, uh, and then I went back to graduate school to more specifically concentrate directly on uh, energy technology and the kinds of issues that I uh, talked about earlier. And, uh, and that's what led to MTPV uh, with the uh, professors here. And, uh, and then there's a laboratory across the street, Draper Laboratory. It used to, be the MIT, used to be the MIT Instrumentation Lab. 
And uh, they, uh, they called me up and said, we saw your resume in the Core 6 resume book. And, you know, and now this was in, uh, this was in 1996. And energy, uh, so how important, how hot a topic was energy in 1996? Not for those of us that were working in the field and dedicated, but I mean, do you guys have any sense? How old were you guys in 1996? Just a couple of examples, ballpark. Six, seven, okay. So it wasn't on the top of you guys' agenda, right? <laughs> um, but do you have a sense of like how relevant it is today, how much in the news it is today versus in 1996? More now or less now? How many things more now than then? Okay, yeah. So, so it, it certainly seems that way. And, uh, um, but at any rate, there were folks over there that thought energy would be important. And so uh, we started developing this MTPV technology there. First uh, analysis, the visit to Professor House, mentioned earlier here on campus, who once he realized that you actually could do better than Planck's law, that we weren't violating Planck's law, that we were just operating outside of the limits that Planck himself put on his law, he said, okay, Go run the numbers, you know? So go back and crank through Maxwell's equations and do all that stuff and come back and tell me how much, more, how much better can you do than Planck's law. And, uh, and so with a tremendous team uh, at Draper Laboratory, uh, many of whom uh, we still work with today, uh, we did that. And then, uh, so this is part of, um, uh, one of you guys here mentioned starting in a larger company, right? You know, what's it look like starting uh, an energy co technology in a, in a startup versus a larger company. In the larger company, there's management to deal with. Management does the resource allocation. And hopefully, which was the case for us, they ask good questions, you know. First they said, go convince Professor House, you know, that, that you have it all right. So when the analysis was done, then they said, okay, now, you know, you're ready to design experiments, start doing the experiments. We built tiny chips, two millimeters by two millimeters, so smaller than, you know, half your baby fingernail. And, uh, and sure enough, you know, the effect was there as the uh, theory, uh, as the analysis predicted. We published that in Applied Physics Letters. The government got interested. Somebody mentioned government funding and whatnot. That can be a very important part of energy technology because how is energy, how is energy technology different than, say, software, than, say, you know, iPhone app? Obaida? You want to take a shot? It's more of you have to build your products as you are just driving your life. Yeah. You need the materials to build your products. Yeah. Or you have to start. Right. Or just you can start from your own company. Right, exactly. Yeah. And uh, um, so there was a recent book written called Lean Startup. Um, and so this, the following is a basically a plug for the engineering field, a plug for what many of you are doing. So uh, this book called Lean Startup, and uh, the folks at HBS and Sloan are very much aware of it, et cetera. Um, but it turns out that uh, uh, it, it's been kind of a hit and it's almost sort of a craze in, in the, the innovation world. Uh, and, uh, but he says in it that he assumes that uh, what they're trying to do can be done. So in other words, if you're making an app for the iPhone, you know, you know that you can actually produce it, it can actually do the thing. Do you do it this way for this market? Do you do it this way for this market? And that's where, that's where the, the, the war gets lost or won in, in that world. But here, in energy, it's, it's really not that way because the, you know, there's no guarantee that things can be done like we've seen billions of dollars go into the liquid biofuels, which one of you guys mentioned recently. And it's turned out that uh, it's very hard to do, very hard to do. So, you know, it, it really, it was a technical impediment, which is dramatically different than, say, if you're in the software world where you basically know that you can build what you want to build. And so whether you're thinking about starting your own businesses or whether you're interacting with management in some big business, you know, that, that understanding of applying the right, uh, the right questions you know, and the right rules. So if you're in an energy business, you probably want the engineers to be more involved in management decisions than maybe if you were doing software or something. What you really need to know is, you know, it's, it's the marketing people that need to drive, uh, that need to, uh, to drive the process. 
Um, okay. Uh, Questions? Reactions? More about his life story? So we, we just to finish, we developed, <laughs> we developed this for about six years, for, uh, excuse me, we developed this for 10 years at Draper Lab, literally across the street. Uh, it was about half internal and half government. And uh, from, you know, starting with just an idea, like you guys have mentioned some ideas, uh, and then analysis and quickly moving on to actually building hardware, tiny hardware, just scientific uh, proof of concept demonstration hardware, and, um, and then scaling up to the kinds of panels and modules that you see us uh, working on now. Uh, the last five years of that work uh, got, went on uh, in, in the startup, MTPV Corporation, uh, which got spun out of uh, Draper. Um, I came back here for a year as a Sloan Fellow, plug for the Sloan Fellows program, and uh, actually the first couple million dollars roughly invested in our, country, in our company was from fellow Sloan Fellows, which was uh, pretty remarkable. Do they have IP? Yes. yes, Draper Labs involved as well. And do you, did they give you the IP or do they have the IP? Um, I actually had the IP here. Ah, okay. okay. And so it went with me to there and then yeah, and that was kind of part of the original. Another important person at MIT whose name is Robert Rines. None of you probably had the pleasure of taking his course. He kind of taught one of the first, the first course probably for engineers and innovation. Now all you guys know about entrepreneurship and innovation. Some of you are smart enough to realize that, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation isn't right for everybody at every moment, uh, uh, and, and it can be very painful uh, along the way, and I'm happy to talk about some of that if you want. And if you were smart, you would ask me about some of that if you want, especially the half of you that are thinking about starting businesses. Um, and, uh, uh, but at any rate, Robert Rines, so he taught a course, it was taught out of course six, I'm not sure why, for like starting like 50 years ago on innovation and patents, and I took that course, and, uh, and he became our patent attorney for MTPV Corporation until he passed away uh, a couple of years ago. Um, so MIT is really all over this uh, technology, and um, uh, I, I guess Hiram said, you know, you should tell them that you think that you guys have the potential to get the 60% efficiency and like a megawatt per square meter. You know, and I hate talking about those things. It really is what keeps us going. You know, I mean, these initial niche markets—they don't—they they don't keep you going. You know, they keep you focused, so you know what you need to do. You know, when you when you get up every day, but they don't keep you going. What keeps you going is a larger vision about something that it doesn't have to be as large as you know, as producing 50% of the world's energy, but it's a larger vision as to how what you're working on creates meaning. You know, and. One of the things I hear you say, I, I hear in your narrative, and that I hear from a lot of entrepreneurs, and in fact a lot of people, but a lot of entrepreneurs in particular, is your path has not been a straight line. Certainly. And, and if you sort of sit there, sit out there and think, I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do this, then I'm going to do that, then I'm going to do that. It sort of worked for Bill Gates, but it doesn't work yeah. very often. Right. <laughs> it doesn't and work And not in the energy often. field, it seems. Yeah. Uh, is it possible there are some fields where it does sort of go more, more linearly? Like, you know, like, maybe. I don't know, maybe, maybe biotech and drug discovery and something like oh, that? Oh, no. no. No, but I mean for individual careers. For individual careers. Individual oh, okay. careers, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, yeah. a lot of people, you know, I was with this startup and it failed, and I worked with this company, and yeah. then I did this, and then yeah. three of us had this idea. Yeah. And you don't sit here at 20, 21 years of age and yeah. see that path. True. The yeah. path opens up in front of you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, oftentimes true. And it's why there's, there's a lot of merit in starting a career in, in existing companies. Because as the young man pointed out, you know, you do get lots of experience and knowledge that addresses those kinds of dilemmas and, and risk, et cetera. Questions? You want to hear about the pain? Ready to hear about the pain? <laughs> give him a little pain. Well, I'll invite, my, I'll invite my wife in to give you the pain. Right? <laughs> Um, yeah, so w when you're with startups and you're getting them funded, uh, that can be challenging, right? So uh, have any of you funded anything to date? You know, even like lawnmower business when you were a kid, you bought the lawnmower. Yes, but we're not. Did you have like raise funding for something? Yeah. Yeah, yeah uh, I'm doing a project this summer uh, in Africa, and we had to raise So 
Yeah. yeah. So where, where are you in that process? Excuse me, where, where are we? Yeah, um, in the fundraising process. Money's in the bank, talking to... Yeah, we're, we're just... We recently have to transfer money to our accounts, so... Congratulations. Nice. That's a real big deal, yeah. And what are you doing you in Africa? You emailed them to transfer, or you actually got the transfer? <laughs> <laughs> um, the handshake well, we emailed them, so hopefully we'll see something soon. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's, that's an important point to be at. The, the, the final... The final little legal details and the little words and everything else, that can take a while. It can take a while for the money to actually show up in the bank. So, so you can't count on it until it's actually there. But it sounds like you guys are very close. Congratulations. What, what are you doing? Um, well, I'm, we're launching a robotics league. Robotics league? Yeah. In which country? Nigeria. Nigeria. Very cool. Wow. Um, was there another hand? Yeah, let's take yes. More, Please. Um, I raised uh, funds for a high school business that I started. Really? Um, yeah, it was just basically selling greeting cards to corporations. And uh, we had we raised money by allowing people to buy shares in our company because uh -huh. we decided to liquidate it at the end of the year. So uh -huh. uh, we raised $600. Excellent. We and, yeah. Okay, so you got two real entrepreneurs here, you know. Asking uh, people for money is an interesting experience. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, any other questions? I did, did promise you sort of a half an hour on something yep. completely different, Great. so we'll do that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Pleasure speaking with you. Okay. So, <laughs> to compromise between those who wanted that talk and those who wanted this talk, uh, I'll give you a little bit of what I would have tried to make an hour and a half out of uh, if you had voted for economic development and green growth. This story starts in 87 with the Brundtland Report, uh, a commission chaired by Gro Harlan Brundtland, a woman who was a former Prime Minister of Norway, that coined the phrase sustainable development and gave it the definition that you see there. And in the first small bullet is sort of the economist's interpretation, and that is the economy has a certain set of assets, intellectual capital and physical capital and in the environment and natural, the natural world, a set of stocks, and the notion is you should pass on to be sustainable a set of stocks that are as desirable as the set you inherited. Uh, the first President Bush called that stewardship. Since he was a Republican, nobody used that term. But, but that's the concept, that you have a certain set of assets. So the, you could say, for instance, that economic development in 19th century Britain was arguably sustainable, right? They burned all the coal. The country was dirty as anything for decades, but they came out of it with tangible capital, intellectual capital, a whole set of other assets that provided a standard of living. Saudi Arabia is mostly spending the oil money on consumption. So when the oil goes, British, British coal is long gone, but Britain used it. And the the issue is that when the Saudi oil is gone, that generation is not going to have, have the assets. Now, it's a little vague, right? It doesn't distinguish between intellectual capital and species. And it doesn't say anything about poverty. And this question of their, the future generation's own needs, I mean, if the future generation wants to only play video games, then wiping out the elephants won't matter. But if future generations actually care a lot about the natural world, then having great video games is not very important. So if you don't know what their needs are, it's a little tough. And you know, I was once interviewed and asked what I thought sustainable development meant, and I gave the Brundtland definition, and, and they said, is that all you mean? That's kind of narrow. I said, what do you mean? I said, what about sustainable communities and sustainable lifestyles and sustainable? It's gotten to mean sort of everything that's good and wholesome and green and a little vague. But nonetheless, start with the sustainable development notion. The next big event was the 1992 conference on environment and development. This was the conference that led to the framework convention on climate change and really started that conversation, the Kyoto Protocol and all of that. That was a big deal. 172 governments participated. 108 heads of state or heads of government went. That's huge. And what came out of it was a lot of paper, but the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which really structured all the subsequent debate. So now we come to 20 years later, and you've got this whole UN machinery. 
and we ought to have a conference Rio plus 20. Well, if the headline was climate in 1992, the question is, what's the headline now? And that leads to the green growth discussion, right? So you began to get, beginning a few years ago, you began to see staff papers emerging talking about the green economy and green development and green growth. Now, I have to say, I've read a lot of this, um, and the definition's not entirely clear. It is described as a subset of sustainable development. And it seems to be that subset of sustainable development strategies that doesn't involve degradation of the natural environment on the way. Right? So the British development wouldn't be, might be sustainable, because at the end of all that dirt, they had high living standards and the prospect of higher living standards, but not green, because the environment was degraded rather substantially it recovered, but it was degraded substantially in the process, and I'm sure species were extinguished. So maybe you could do fossil fuels and be green. I think so. But you know, if you think about alternative ways of doing sustainable development, there's another, another part of the World Bank. The World Bank, the UN, the OECD, and others are talking about green economy. If you go on the World Bank website and you look carefully, you see papers on inclusive growth. And that says, well, you have to be sustainable, but you should focus on poverty. Green growth says you ought to be sustainable, but you should focus on the environment. OK. Where do you go from there? Well. This is what is sort of the interesting thing. Particularly the UN now argues that if you make very large investments in going green, growth of living standards will increase. The phrase that's used is a new engine of growth. Now, if you're a cynical economist, you realize that not only does that mean there's a free lunch, but one we'd all be paid to eat. Right? Going green will raise living standards after a very short period of time. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about that. You can imagine how I, I and others got engaged. This was sort of very, if you don't know this world, the World Bank and the OECD and the UN have a lot of, not to insult anybody, but they have a lot of very smart people without much to do. So a lot of papers generated, and mostly people pay little attention to it. But suddenly, and I'll get into specifics, suddenly you have these organizations revving up for a big world conference talking about, talking about massive changes in investment strategy. And uh, I'll, give you a, I'll give you a sense of it. So economists have begun to write about this. What's on the reading list? What's on, this, what's on Stellar is a couple of, of the shorter, uh, I think World Bank and I don't remember whether it's UN or OECD publications, uh, peace of mind commenting on this whole thing that's, it'll be the introduction to a special issue of energy economics. Um, and then some other, some other papers and I want to talk about, about some, of the, uh, some of the issues. So let me talk about just some of the issues here. One issue that everybody points out is absolutely right. GDP doesn't pick this up. Right? GDP, we talk about stocks and flows. You have family silver, you sell the family silver, you have a party, the party shows up in GDP. The fact that somehow the silver's out of your hands or it shows up in sort of your consumption, certainly. Uh, if you burn down, if you, and there are plenty of African countries, plenty of other countries that have basically burned down, New Hampshire did it, Vermont did it, you burn down the forest to fuel economic development, there's a sense in which you're changing one asset to another. Certainly just looking at what gets produced understates the cost. So if you look at net national product, which gets depreciation of some assets, subtracts from gross national product, it picks up some of this, but you know, properly measured, you'd want to take into account the fact 
that what happened in 19th century Britain was they paid for economic development in part by trashing the environment, in part by uh, killing people with the health effects of all that smoke and degrading the natural environment. So you'd want to take that into account when you said what's income, what are living standards really. We don't know how to do that. There's work at the UN, there's work at the US. But you know, part of the green growth argument could be that what you want to measure isn't GDP growth, but growth in living standards, taking into account all this other stuff. Taking into account changes in health, taking into account changes in, in the natural environment, and so forth. So you could say, OK, that's a, that's a relevant point. Another relevant point is they talk about increasing investment, taking 2% of world GDP and investing it in green things. Well, if you make massive investments, and they're not terrible, they will eventually raise growth. Right? So you're increasing, that's, the numbers in my paper, they don't matter, but it's basically what the UN is saying is the world as a whole needs to make a massive increase in green investments. If you do that, you probably will raise growth. That doesn't mean it's a good idea. If you doubled US capital formation, you'd raise US growth. A, how do you do it? B, is it actually a good deal? But the kicker here, most of these models say, here's how we raise growth. We raise growth by reducing environmental limits on growth. What would environmental limits be? Well, in the limit, everybody gets sick and, product and productivity falls off. So if you've ever tried to breathe in large Chinese cities, you get a sense that there is some theoretical, that, that this may be more than theory in some places at some times. But globally, probably not. So two good points and one point that's sort of OK in theory. The good points are, in terms of going green, that GDP growth isn't really a good measure of growth in standards of living. It isn't a good measure of sustainability, period. Sure. Increasing the rate of investment in, in green technologies and lots of other things will raise growth. Yeah. So would investment in railroads. So would investment in highways. So would investments in education. But uh, that's certainly true. It is possible that one way going green increases economic growth is by sort of reducing environmental limits. The soil's exhausted. The people are sick et cetera, et cetera. The aquifers are depleted, and you're stuck. That is certainly possible. And if you're really a pessimistic person, you can look down the road. And climate change is another set of mechanisms that could do this. But is it globally quantitatively important in the near term? No evidence. OK. More relevant points. Certainly, in rich countries, you can make the argument that, yes, we should be greener than we are, um, particularly in this country. If you think carbon dioxide does anything, it probably makes sense to switch, uh, that understates the case, to switch uh, to less uh, carbon intensive growth paths, cut emissions, conservation, shift to natural gas. The interesting question and the politically tricky question is in poor countries. Because the green growth story is a story not about the rich countries. It's a story about mostly poor countries. Massive investments in going green in poor countries. Well, massive investments in almost anything sensible in poor countries would be a good thing. Where does it come from? Probably doesn't come internally. This is the climate problem revisited in a way. Probably doesn't come internally because they don't have it and they have other priorities. You know, again, telling the Chinese not to use the coal while so many millions of people live in poverty is a tough point, tough sale. Massive foreign aid, well, appropriating massive foreign aid. Again, there's some numbers in my paper about, eh, about 400 billion a year from the US. 
Imagine walking into Congress and saying, yes, yes, I know we have problems, but we need to send $400 billion a year in foreign aid. You would not get a vote on the floor. You would not get a vote in a committee. And the other problem is, the history says, if you dump lots of foreign aid on countries that don't have good governance structures, you don't get good results. It gets stolen, it gets wasted. So that's not likely. So without the aid, how can you possibly say, in Africa in particular, where there is hydro potential, where there is coal, and where there is a lot of poverty, why not use it? Now you can say, you can say, um, actually that's wrong, you can say uh, the uh, equity issues are absolutely clear. We talked about this and we talked about, about uh, climate change. If, if I'm a poor country and you say to me, we really need you to go green, uh, I would say to you, you didn't. You got rich, you burned your coal, you cut down your trees, why can't I? If you give me money, I, maybe I won't, but maybe if you give me money, I'll waste it. It'll go to a bank account in Switzerland or the Cayman Islands. Uh, or, or, you know, it, we, it, it, I'll hire my brother-in-law to build the dam. So this is sort of a terrible thing. Now, this is, this is something that's sort of not on, as the English say. You, there's just no way to, to get it done without massive transfers of aid, and there's no way to get the massive transfers of aid done as far as I can tell, in any case. Um, one point I do want to make, though, and that is while you're thinking about startups, one of the really interesting opportunities globally is the large number of people who have no electricity, period, who are off-grid, who are in rural areas. And that's one of those interesting bottom of the pyramid opportunities that a lot of people have tried to crack because having lighting at night makes a huge difference. It means kids can stay in school. Uh, it means the family can work after, after the sun goes down at various things, but in particular, kids can study. Um, so, and there are a lot, of, a lot of people have tried to crack that economically usually some version of solar plus storage deployed at the community level or solar lanterns that can be sold cheaply and charged in the daytime and used at night. So there are lots of opportunities there. It isn't massive. It isn't massive. The other thing to point out is one of the real tragedies here and one of the reasons why the whole green growth notion is, is, is compelling but painful and that is Again, there's a piece uh, on Stellar. If you ask who's going to be harmed by climate change, it's mostly the developing world, right? I mean, we can afford to build a wall around Manhattan to deal with sea level rise. Bangladesh can't build a wall. But of course, the developing world is also driving climate change. If you look at the growth in emissions, as we talked about on several occasions. There's just no obvious fix. So the green growth is trying to, is, a, is an attempt by a whole set of staff people to advocate for massive change in the way the world runs that's probably not gonna work. It's not gonna work politically. Which is one reason why I didn't feel like doing an hour and a half on it. Because uh, I, I think the air has gone out. There will be a, a circus uh, at, in Rio. There will probably be 100 heads of state or government in Rio next, next month. I'm, I'm told ho hotel rooms go, are going for thousands of dollars a night. Uh, so it will be a big circus. I'm told that the official US government position is that Rio should produce a clean five-page statement of principles and policies, and that the current working draft is 260 pages long. Uh, diplomats do this. Diplomats do this. So, so this is, this is the, the, the story of people trying to figure out what comes after the Framework Convention on Climate Change, what comes after thinking about sustainability. And the answer is, or was, a major push toward being green, please, really a serious major push. I think it lacks intellectual foundation. I think it lacks political foundation. I think it will be much discussed at Rio and nothing will happen. 
I do hate the last talk to be so cynical. Maybe we'll be help, hopeful next week when we hear your papers. Uh, do you have questions or comments on any of this? That's sort of the, this is the current diplomatic state of play. This is an attempt to do climate by the back door and call it green. It isn't going to work, sadly, I think. Yeah, Julian? I'm curious if you expect anything like productive at all to come out of it. <laughs> well, you know, diplomacy is a really strange process. It's easy to mock, right? Because, um, particularly in climate, there's this group of diplomats that like to get together every couple of years and talk and make progress. But without government support, it's all just talk. Given that the main problem the world sees right now is slow recovery from a deep recession, and given the current state of politics in the US on climate, I expect lovely pros to come out of this. Um, there might be agreement on something small. They might get something on forests. I give you my cynical lecture about forest protection sometime. About as long as you don't affect, if, as long as you don't affect the demand for wood, protecting this forest doesn't reduce the amount of woodcut. Uh, but uh, that's just just the economist. I, I expect there will be some agreements. I don't think they will be very important. Um, I, and as I say, I, I I expect a circus. The folks in the diplomatic community would say that's too cynical. Even just talking with the whole world involved, putting a spotlight on these issues, keeping up pressure of some international kind on governments that don't want to act helps. Sort of the water on a stone view of the world. Um, you know, that's what they do. And every so often there'll be a chance. You'll get the Montreal, uh, you'll get the Montreal Protocol on ozone depleting gases because that process had started. Those meetings were being held. New science came, the structure was in place, the support mobilized, bang. We got a very constructive international agreement. It isn't going to happen here because the preconditions aren't there. But the water will drip on the stone. The water will drip on the stone. Rory? Has anyone, well, what's been people's response to people saying the rich world didn't follow a green growth path, but they followed the greenest growth path available to them at the time within economics? And you could argue that, you know, Britain, if they could have, Britain wouldn't have covered all their cities in smog and soot, but they couldn't. And the growth is good for its own sake. Yeah, that's, that's a decent debating point. But you also say, when did the rich world begin to take the environment seriously? A and when did it begin to have any impact on policy? And that's sort of 60s, 70s. Right? You don't see much, you don't see much conscious thinking about it. Um, the, the big U.S. event was DDT and Rachel Carson's Silent Spring, which was, do you remember? 57, 62, around there, around there. Right? Birds were dying because DDT was making their shells too thin and they couldn't reproduce. That was like, oh my God, our chemicals are actually doing something out there. But, you know, to most people, Better things through better living through chemistry. So to argue that we were doing the best we could is to argue that we were doing it unconsciously. And that, <laughs> that may be true, but it's not that, not that persuasive. It's a good shot, though. Anything else? Anything else on your minds? Feeling ready for the quiz on Wednesday? You were brilliantly reviewed on, uh, on Friday. Ready to go. Okay. Off we go.